any further, let's close our eyes and let's have a prayer. Our gracious Father in heaven, again, it's prayer meeting. And the whole objective of prayer meeting is to truly be in conversation with you, Father. We are wanting you to come and speak to us. We are wanting you to help us to be attentive as we listen to your words. We long to experience the fullness of the plan of salvation. We long to see that beautiful character of Christ revealed in our lives. We long to be prepared for heaven. So Holy Spirit, as we spend time in the presence of the word, conform us to the image of Christ, mould us, make us like him, for this is truly our desire. And the words of David ring in my mind, gracious Father, where David said, Your word have we hid in our hearts that we might not sin, sin against you. And so we do pray that you'll take this word, this living word, and that you'll make it a reality in our own lives. I do pray, Father, that each of the people that are watching and those that will watch later, that you will be with them and that each one has an individual need. And Father, you know that need. Will you please meet it? For we know that in you we move and live and have our existence. You are the author and the finisher of our existence. Without you, we are nothing. Tonight, as we study your word, help us, dear Jesus, to see what angels admire and spend time focusing on. And may it become our focus too. For we ask this, dear Jesus, in your lovely name. Amen. Okay, dear friends, what I want you to do is to go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now, I was just wondering before we actually get to the verse that I want us to read and maybe just to get into the topic, just to create a bit of the background. I wonder how many of you watching with me tonight and studying with me have ever found yourself in a place where you're experiencing the last minutes of a person's life. And... Um, what the conversation is about. What are the sentiments of that person's heart? And I wonder, dear friends, how many have actually witnessed the death of a loved one or the death of a person. I have discovered in all my years of ministry that the question that really becomes the question that needs to be answered is when we finally come to the place that we lay down our lives here, what's next? And to know what's next, that is important, but more than knowing what is next, is are we ready and can we have what is next? Now, in the book of Corinthians, particularly 1 Corinthians, there are four main themes that Paul addresses as he writes to the church in Corinth. Now, a family by the name of um, the Chloe family, family or household had sent message to Paul regarding certain problems that were, that were experienced in that little church there in Corinth. And as I looked at the challenges that face that church, I recognize that we can learn something from the epistle, the message that Paul wrote to them. Now the four main points that um, Paul addresses is the first one which is foremost and really crucial as far as his understanding is concerned is what is truly to love like God. How do we actually love God with all our hearts, with all our strength, with all our mind, with the whole being? And how do we love our neighbors as ourselves? And what is the correct definition of love? Now, in a past a presentation that I gave, I spoke about uh, what is love. And basically that would be addressing in some sense the first topic 
that Paul felt was urgent or important in his understanding and that is that we need to know what love is because that is what what it's all about. In actual fact, the, the chapter that we used to describe this or to, to discuss this was 1 Corinthians 13. And we discover when all else fails, eloquence of tongue or word, um, the ability to heal or to do wonderful things, wisdom, all of those things, faith, even the understanding of prophecies um, falls into the background when you come to understand that what God has required of each one of us is that we are to love just as he is love. Do you understand? So Paul addresses that first subject. Then the second thing that he addresses was that there was a serious problem within the church and that was the unity that uh, was not found in the church of Corinth. And the reason why is that everybody had different opinions regarding certain subjects. Now, it is that particular theme or point that I'm going to be discussing a little bit tonight to get our, our, our thoughts right. Because, you know, Jesus actually pray, prayed, and I'd like you to go with me to John chapter 17, because Jesus appeals to the Father. And there is one of the things that he longs for and, and he prays for us. And this is what I want you to look at with me. So I want you to go to John chapter 17, verse 20. And this part addresses us in the future. It says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Listen to this. All of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. Now, Dear friends, to me, if I had to ask you, what is the greatest um, evidence in the church that we belong to Christ or that we have the truth, and that is that we will be unified? There won't be this, these different um, divisions within the church that we now even experience. And dear friends, the reason why we have so many divisions is because each one of us feels we have some kind of insight or foreknowledge or information that others don't have. But I'm going to be addressing this. So let's start off by first of all going to the verse that I want us to read. And it's, it is to be the bottom line of everything. You see, I, I asked you, what would you say or give people in their dying moments, the last minutes of their lives, what would you feel would be of crucial importance in those last moments? And dear friends, I want to tell you that sometimes what we tend to have made of such great importance in our lives that occupies so much of our time now, we would actually find so irrelevant when it comes to the final heartbeats of one's life. Okay, so I want you to notice there is one subject that is to be spoken of and actually discussed throughout your life. And that is this subject. Paul says very clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and the, the verse that we are going to be focusing on is verse 2, but I want to start with verse 1, because listen to what Paul says. And so it is with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, listen to this, Paul is saying, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or with human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. You see, it is not if you can persuade people with your words or with wisdom that we need to address the following subject. Because Paul says, verse 2, For I resolved, listen to this, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, I want you to really listen to me tonight, dear friends, because when I think of the resolves that we are to make, I can't help but think of Daniel there in chapter 1, of Daniel chapter 1, where we read the most powerful statement, and it is a statement that Daniel made when he was still a young man there in 
um, Babylon. He had just arrived there. He probably wouldn't be older than, say, maybe 14, 15, 16, around there. And he arrives in Babylon a captive. And yet he was from the royal household. I'm going to bring this all out as we go on. But position doesn't count anything or doesn't hold or any ground or give you any ground for for favoritism before God. Um, so birthright doesn't mean anything. Um, your wisdom doesn't e- mean anything. And I'm going to be explaining this as we go on. But we notice that in Daniel chapter 1, he finds himself in Babylon. And we are clearly advised in Revelation that we also, we too find ourselves in Babylon. And we are counseled to come out of Babylon. And yet, as Jesus just said there in John chapter 17, that God is not asking his father to take us out of the world, but that we are not to be of the world or to behave like the world, but that we should rather be one as he and the father are one. That is our greatest evidence. And what should the first thing that we should all be unified on? What should all of us have resolved to be our main resolution? And I want you to look at Daniel chapter 1. When Daniel finds himself in Babylon, and as he looks at the tremendous challenges that he has, you know, he sees the great temptations. He sees the attempt by um, Ashpenaz, who was the chief um, um, mass or the the person that was put in charge of the, the captives, especially those who were going to be trained in the, the affairs of King Nebuchadnezzar. Ashpenaz knew that knew and was extremely wise in how to win people over. And that wasn't to put them under pressure, but to actually get them to accept and to believe that what they were getting from the Babylonians far exceeded that which they had had in Jerusalem. So I want you to understand it's not a new thing. I always think of Eve when she was standing at the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The devil influenced her to think that she was being deprived by God and that he was holding something back for her, from her. And this is what Ashpenaz does. He approaches them. He gives them the best courses of meal. He explains things to them. He has the best literature, etc. But Daniel does something that is crucial. And Daniel chapter 1 verse 8 says, But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. So what was Daniel's resolution? And dear friends, this has really got nothing to do with with, um, really just the the physical aspect of eating wine and or drinking wine and eating unclean foods or foods that were offered to idols. No, this has really got nothing to do with that. It's got to do with the mindset that you need to have when you are in this world. And that is, first of all, do you really believe that I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor come into the mind of man what God has prepared for you? Because that truly, to me, is the important thing. I want you to notice that in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul actually addresses that and says, you know, so many times we get into debate about the things that God is requiring of us and why we do it and shouldn't do it, etc. But then we read there in verse 9, However, as it is written, what, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, And what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. Now, dear friends, that verse clearly tells me that we are not in a position at all to even understand the things that God has got and is preparing for us. And one of the lessons we need to really learn here is not to try and have an understanding of why we are to do things, but truly We should rather be obedient to God's words because we believe that everything that God wants of us is for our best interest. Do you understand? So we should put aside worldly wisdom when it comes to these things. Now, I want you to notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul starts off in verse 10 by appealing 
to the people. He says, I appeal to you. And dear friends, I really see that we will never be able to progress along this life's journey of even winning souls to God's kingdom or even becoming a church that's unified unless we listen to this appeal of Paul. Paul says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there are no divisions among you, but that you are perfectly united in mind and thought. Now, dear friends, before we go any further, we need to recognize that the first thing we need to really understand is where, what do we have in common? Now, I want you to notice something else that Paul then goes on in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 to say something. And I want you to look with me from verse 26 on. Because Paul wants us to remember something, especially those of you who have walked on the journey with God for so long and perhaps have become victorious in so many ways in your lives, but you start looking at your victories and the crowns that you are wearing instead of looking at the blood of Christ. Because remember what Paul says, I really don't want to know anything. I don't want to know the wisdom of man, but I wish to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So I want you just to see why Paul is speaking like this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, he says, Brothers and sisters, again he's addressing. We've just had it there again. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters. That was in verse 10. Now he's saying again, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. So where were you, dear friends, at the beginning of your Christian experience? What was your background? Where did you come from? What kind of lifestyle did you live? Were you um, a, living a godly life or were you living an ungodly life? We tend, we tend to forget where we came from. And Paul says in order for us to be unified, we need to all understand that we've come from the same background. He says then, I want you to notice, not many of you, we're wise by human standards. And yet, you know, one of the things I've discovered about our church is because of the incredible writings that we do have and that are, we are exposed to in Ellen White, we really do believe that we've become the wisdom of the world. And yet we forget that right in the beginning of everything, we were so unwise. And yet when we approach people, we approach people with this haughty attitude of how wise we are. And it's almost foolishness, dear friends, when I consider how that God used plain fishermen who were unschooled to confuse the wisdom of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So I want you to notice that Paul says, some of you were not even wise in human standards. You had no qualifications to stand up and boast and talk about in anything. In actual fact, you would have taken a back seat in most of the discussions that we now some days find ourselves in the front of. We like to talk about what we know. And yet, dear friends, we really know nothing. I want you to look again further where what Paul goes on. He says, not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. I mean, dear friends, some of you might have even progressed and grown in your position in society as a result of the blessings of God, and you have now a greater influence. But it says, not many of you were influential. Not many of you were of noble birth. And yet, dear friends, in our um, relationship and actually link up with Christ, we, we, we become wise and we, 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 we grow and we actually become of noble birth. And we, we become influential. But it's not because of our doings. And dear friends, I really think that we need to be cautious in the way in which we approach people. We are very bombastic in the way in which we come across with the information that we have. And I want you to understand if there is anything that we should really be bombastic about, it's what Paul says that he was wanting to know. And that is to know nothing. Dear friends, I want you to understand when it really comes down to the crunch, 
It is what do you know about what Jesus has done for you. That is what counts. You know, the, the most interesting thing to me, dear friends, is that one day when we stand before God, it's not going to be what we know that is going to save us. Nothing of that. Not all our understanding of the, the science of food. Not all our understanding of the um, interpretation of prophecies. Not any of those things that we seem to think of so great a value now will be of value in the day that we stand before God. Because truthfully, at that point, as Jesus said, if you testify me before man mankind, I will testify about you before my Father. Dear friends, I want you to know that truly you should know, want to know nothing but gain the wisdom of the plan of salvation, of what Jesus is all about. It's time for us to lift our eyes from these, this, these worldly occupations that take up our time and rather focus on what's really going on in heaven, where Jesus at this present moment is interceding on our behalf. That is true wisdom. That is truly the, the subject that we should be speaking about. What is going on in heaven? And dear friends, I want you to know that at this very moment, there is an investigative judgment going on. And it's not based on how much you know, it's actually based on who you know. You see, the interesting thing is that when your name comes up before the Father, He doesn't ask, you know, are they deserving of eternal life? But He actually asks His Son this question, do you know them? And I want you to tell you something, dear friends. We talk about who we know. And the only way we get to know who we know is by being in conversation with that person. It's not hearsay. I always think of the words of Job where he puts his hands over his mouth and he actually says this, Up to now I heard about you, God, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. Dear friends, I want to ask you this question. Is Jesus the beginning and the end of everything? If you didn't have or had to choose a topic of discussion, would you choose Christ? Would you talk about him? Would you lift him up? Would you magnify his strength? Would you tell them about the blood that he shed for you? Would you tell people about that? Would you say that, you know, in yourself you were wicked and wretched and lost, but in Christ you are saved? You know, dear friends, what I'm really getting at is when I look at what Paul was addressing, until we can come to this place where we all agree that the most important person in our lives and the most important information that we should have or gain wisdom on is on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Who is he? You know, we are actually counseled that we are to study the closing scenes of Christ's life. Now that's so interesting to me. Up to the time of the Garden of Gethsemane, we have a lot of teachings from Christ, all about what the kingdom of God is like and what we should be like, etc. But if you study truthfully the closing scenes of Christ's life, it's not about you. It's about the burden that the Father had to save mankind. The closing scenes of Christ's life actually reveal the true purpose as to why God sent his son. And that was to die for us, wretched sinners. I always think of those words of Ellen White in the book Steps to Christ where she says, What do we bring when we bring our all to Jesus? She says we bring a heart that is filled with sin for him to purify. That's what we bring to Jesus. We bring wretchedness to him. We bring sins to him. And he alone is the one that is qualified and capable of actually cleansing us and saving us. Dear friends, until Jesus becomes that person 
that we want to know nothing else about, we will be a divided church. I'm always so amazed how quickly one can be divided. And it's a danger, dear friends. We are divided in what we eat. We are divided in the way in which we feel we should dress. We are divided in the way in which we feel we should worship. Those are irrelevant things, but we should never be um, divided when it comes to the plan of salvation. We should be unified when it comes to that. We should be in agreement with Paul that we will not, if we had to proclaim anything, we will proclaim this only thing, that it's Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's what we should be talking about. That should be our first love. That should be the conversation on our minds and our mouths all the time. Not our achievements, dear friends. In closing, I want to just share a thought with you. I once read of a person who considered what it would be like one day when we get to heaven. And we should meet those of our loved ones who had perhaps died long before we did. And when we get together in paradise and we are there in the New Jerusalem and they come up to us and they ask us, what was it like afterwards? And we start um, telling them about our sufferings and how that we had to endure such incredible hardships all for Jesus Christ's sake and all of that. And we start looking that all of a sudden I'm counseled that we will be, we'll come to the real realization and we will take our crowns off our heads, which are crowns of victory. We'll take them off and we'll throw them down at the feet of Jesus. And we will all exclaim with one voice that heaven was cheap enough for every person to get there. Dear friends, have we made the plan of salvation so complicated with our wisdom and our interpretation? Has our understanding of the plan of salvation become so involved that children cannot understand it? And yet our message should be of such a simple nature that children should be able to understand and accept the wonderful love of Jesus Christ. So tonight, my thoughts are, in your closing dying moments, who will be the person that you will be looking forward to seeing on the other side? Who will be that person that you will be speaking about as you close your eyes? I think of um, Stephen as he was being stoned for his faith. He looked up. <laughs> And he saw Jesus Christ, the one that he loved so dearly. And that, that vision that he had allowed him to say the following words, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Dear friends, who puts the sparkle in your eye? I want to just remind you, dear friends, Always keep the sun in your eyes.